Right. Hi, everyone. And um, I am Dario. Uh, thanks for staying until now, until the very last <laughs> session of the day, at least in this dev room, and uh, coming seeing this talk about uh, um, maximizing the performance of a virtual machine or rather of workloads running inside virtual machines, which oftentimes is simplified as, I mean, I do the vCPU pinning and then I'm done. I'm not I. Uh, well, it's not uh, for that's the bulk of it actually, but uh, there are a uh, couple of more things, at least in my opinion. And uh, let's start having a very quick look at this um, class of processors, of CPUs, which are the uh, CPUs from AMD, uh, the so called Epic or Epic 2, because it's a second generation of this uh, architecture uh, family, uh, 7002 uh, series, which, is, which are uh, multi-chip modules composed of nine dies, that's how they call it, the, the, these things. Uh, one of these dies is uh, dedicated to I.O. and off-chip communications. In every socket, I mean, there are nine of these dies in every socket, and one is dedicated to I.O., it's the I.O. die. And the other eight uh, ones are uh, the actual compute dies. Then there is the concept of core complex CCX, which is basically a um, set, a combination of four cores, which, it, which also means eight threads, because these processors have hyper-threading. And uh, we will uh, look into this a little bit uh, uh, in more detail later. Each core complex has its own uh, L1 to L3 uh, cache uh, hierarchy. Uh, but yeah, uh, we will see about this later. Let's also introduce the concept of core complex die, or CCD, which is basically two CCXs. And so eight cores, 16 threads. Each CCD, this is the important part, uh, uh, this is the important thing about CCDs, each CCD, CCD has a um, dedicated Infinity Fabric, it's the name of the technology, link to the I.O. die. Right, and so uh, these are processors that can uh, uh, have up to 64 cores, uh, which means 128 threads, and you can have them in a uh, two-socket uh, arrangement. So, uh, yeah. And each socket has eight memory channels for to, 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 toward the memory. So yeah, these are links if you download the slides and uh, uh, navigate them to uh, fetch uh, more information, but you can easily find a lot more information on Google. So I said that this talk is going, about, is going to be about tuning, uh, uh, virtualization, and workload running, some workload at least, running inside virtual machines. We will, I will uh, say a few things, most of which are going to be general enough, but uh, we will uh, uh, use a case study uh, throughout the talk. And so um, I will speak um, about this um, effort, this work that we did together, us, uh, Suze, uh, with uh, AMD as a partner, um, on uh, coming up with a set of tuning advice uh, for optimizing the performance of one of our uh, SUSE products, SUSE Linux Enterprise uh, Server 15 SP1, which is pretty much the same as, that, 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 as uh, uh, OpenSUSE Leap 15.1, um, on this class of AMD processors. So I will use this as a case study. That's uh, important to to, to, to say and to remember. Right, so this is um, another way to look at that, uh, uh, a one specific instance of the series of processors that I introduced before, the 7742, whatever. It's a big one, uh, it's one of, it's, it's the biggest uh, setup, the one that I said that uh, has uh, uh, 64 cores, uh, 100, which means 128 threads and uh, uh, comes uh, into sockets. And this is the one that we used for uh, the, this guide and the one that I'm going to, to refer to for this talk. Uh, a close up on one um, CCX. Uh, this is what I was saying. So each CCX has uh, its own L3 cache. And, and of course, each core also has a dedicated L1 and L2 uh, as usual. But the fact that there is uh, 
uh, an L3 cache uh, per CCX and, uh, for example, not per NUMA node, it's a little bit, well, it's not weird, it's a, but it's something specific about this architecture, something which is at least very different than uh, many other architectures that you find around, at least, at least in the x86 world. And, uh, yeah, tuning the performance basically means uh, if you really want to, achieve, to try to achieve uh, performance inside VMs which, with, uh, th that uh, matches the uh, one that you would get on bare metal, then it also means static partitioning. You cannot avoid doing uh, at least some of, some of that. And uh, does, it make, does it still make sense to speak about virtualization then if we have to partition resources uh, statically? Well, uh, yes, according to me at least, especially on uh, such a large platform because you can still use it for, for uh, uh, server consolidation because it's so huge that you can put a lot of uh, VMs on it. And then you have the argument about flexibility and uh, high availability and other stuff. So what resources are we talking about partitioning? Well, all the <laughs> relevant resources, CPU, memory, uh, and I.O. Uh, this talk will, focus, will uh, be um, focus, focusing on CPU and memory. I.O., uh, we'll leave it for another, another one. Uh, so the first kind of partition is, par partitioning sorry, is going to be between host and guest or guests, uh, meaning that you want to, you most of the time want to leave some of the resources, uh, uh, namely some CPUs and some memory to the host because you have to connect with SSH or whatever to the host to do monitoring or management. Uh, uh, you, uh, and then, they, and then uh, oftentimes, um, depending on the configuration, but I mean, most of the time, uh, the host has to carry out some activity on behalf or uh, to help, uh, let's, say like, let's say like that, the VMs, for, for example, for doing I.O., uh, running the QM I.O. threads, uh, whatever. Uh, recommendation, well, it depends on uh, what are the, your actual goals. Um, one good rule of thumb is to leave uh, at least one core per socket to host activities. Although on this particular architecture, uh, it will be better if you, would, if you manage not to break, uh, for example, what we said before, uh, to be the CCX because of, uh, otherwise you will have uh, the VMs, or some of the VMs, and the host sharing uh, uh, L3 caches, which it's generally not something that you want for good performances. If possible, you would also try to not break, uh, you should also try to not break a CCD, but then that, that would mean leaving uh, eight cores, 16 threads for the, for the host, which you may or may not uh, uh, want wanting to, to want to do, and the RAM still how, how much memory to leave to the host? It really depends. Let's say 50 gigabytes, and uh, be done with it. So another thing, um, huge pages. Uh, so whether or not use huge pages and how to use them. Typically, and this is one of the general things. This is really general about virtualization, not on, not uh, really specific about this platform. Uh, if you, if possible, you always want to use huge pages for the virtual machine, but you don't want to use the trans them in the transparent huge pages way. Let's say you want to pre-allocate the huge pages uh, at boot time of the host and then uh, use them for uh, um, as the backing of the memory of the VMs. And, uh, and you don't want to have uh, uh, automatic NUMA balancing at the host level because you, have, uh, you, you, are, doing, you are going to do, to do static partitioning anyway. In the guest, it depends. It depends on the workload that you run in the guest. It's not different than uh, tuning a workload on bare metal from this point of view. Once you have tuned the host, then inside the VM, you just treat the problem like you would uh, do it uh, on a bare metal machine uh, similar to the VM that uh, you are um, focusing on. And one word about power management at the host uh, level, of course. Uh, again, it depends. Um, in general, it's good to uh, do at least some benchmarks limiting, for example, the deep sleep states and using uh, like performance as a CPU frame governor because it would help you get uh, a first uh, set of results which are um, consistent and that, uh, and, and that, that don't vary too much. Uh, then uh, it depends whether this is uh, okay for you uh, and for your um, actual goals to 
uh, keep these settings or uh, if uh, saving a, a little bit more of power is important and, and if, if it is you have to reassess the tuning and rerun in the benchmarks uh, and so on and so forth uh, with the proper uh, power management configuration uh, that, you, that you want to have, let's say, in production. Then, uh, as I said, pinning the vCPUs, we want to do that, and we do that uh, in, for example, libvert, uh, with, I mean, like this, and uh, you want to, if possible, I was already touching on this before, if possible, you want to pin the vCPUs of the VMs in such a way that uh, you uh, pin to the CCDs. Uh, because uh, in such a way you won't have two different VMs which uh, will have to share the bandwidth of the infinity fabric link uh, uh, from the CCD to the IO die. Um, this means that if you, if you do that, you will, be able to, uh, you will be able to configure like that uh, up to either 14 or 16 VMs. It depends on how many <laughs> CPUs you leave to the host on an Epic 2 platform like the one I showed at the beginning. And um, uh, if it's not possible uh, to pin at the CCD level, uh, then you may consider pinning at the CCX level. Because again, uh, yeah, you, then, then the VM will, will share the uh, bandwidth of the uh, infinite fabric link to the IODI, but at least they don't share the L3 caches. Uh, and at worst, at least pin to cores and don't make VMs share uh, cores uh, and uh, uh, execute on, on sibling cipher thread and also share L1 and L2 caches unless you really want to ask for big troubles. Uh, memory placement, similar to vCPUs, uh, but simpler, even simpler probably, because if the VM uh, that you uh, want to use is big enough uh, to um, span to take both the NUMA nodes, then uh, you put half of the memory of the VM in one NUMA node and the other half on the other, and then you also, uh, I guess, yeah, I have this in the next slide. Uh, so let's, um, yeah, sorry. And then uh, in, the, in the other case, uh, which is when the VM is not large enough uh, to span both the NUMA node and it's, uh, it fits in uh, uh, just one of the NUMA nodes, then you put all its memory in that NUMA node, as simple as that. Uh, and then enlightenment, uh, that's what I wanted to try to say before. Uh, if the VM spans both of the NUMA node, then you have, yes, put the uh, half of his memory, uh, put, sorry, one half of his memory on one node and the other half on the other, but you also have to uh, provide to the VM a, a suitable and meaningful virtual topology, um, virtual NUMA topology, actually. Uh, if, if it doesn't, uh, uh, you're fine, you just uh, uh, enforce that, uh, the, uh, VM, the memory stays on one NUMA node, but you still have to provide, in both cases, a meaningful uh, CPU topology, so virtual sockets, threads, cores, stuff like that, and also a um, good, let's say, CPU model. Uh, what does it mean good? Uh, we will see uh, in, a few, in a few slides. Yeah, then secure virtualization, secure encrypted virtualization, AMD and this services processor also provides a feature which basically allows you to encrypt the memory of the virtual machines. And it's transparent to the VMs. Uh, it's very efficient, it's very, it's very cool. Uh, there are instructions to set it up. I'm not going to cover these in details. Uh, and security, so the hardware uh, vulnerabilities uh, which are well known these days. Uh, the good thing about this processor is that AMD processor in general, and this in particular, are only, vuln only let's say, vul vulnerable to a subset of them. And in particular, the nastier one for virtualization, uh, this is not vulnerable, so uh, we are happy about that. Uh, benchmarks, the benchmarks that I run. Uh, I said I wanted to focus on CPU and memory, so I will uh, show results of running stream, which is a memory benchmark, and I will show uh, what I will show right now is going to be the results of running stream on bare metal and then inside one or more VMs and, and so, so that we can compare uh, results. And you can configure stream. Uh, um, in our case, we used the op OpenMP for uh, parallelization of the stream jobs and so we used a different number of threads, which was either 16 or 32 uh, on bare metal. In general, the rule of thumb again is to use as many threads as there are memory channels, but this is not an information that is easy, uh, easily available uh, via software, that you can easily uh, figure out via software. And so you can 
kind of approximated by using one thread per LLC. And this, is apply, this applies to both the host and uh, the virtual machine. So what do I have here? Here I have uh, in, purple, the, in the purple bars the results of running string on bare metal. And uh, then in green, uh, stream run inside the VM without any kind of tuning. So the performance don't match, and you see it very well. Then I applied a little bit of tuning, so the VM had a virtual topology, but uh, uh, it wasn't doing any pinning of CPU and memory. And so again, in the blue, uh, in the light blue bar, and again, the performance uh, uh, don't match. And then, uh, magic, you apply the tuning that I described, uh, and uh, you uh, see in the last um, bar that now the performance of bare metal and inside VMs, inside just one VM, uh, uh, basically uh, matches. So that's what we wanted. And this is for uh, this is when running stream uh, just in uh, single thread mode. Uh, the same when using 30 threads for stream. As as you can see, the, uh, there is we, we are able to reach very good performance uh, because inside the VM we achieve pretty much the same level as um, on the host. Uh, here, I use two VMs instead of one, so there are a lot of uh, uh, elements of the plot. You would want to focus on, again, the first one is bare metal. The red and black ones are, I'm now using two VMs, and uh, are the um, score, the results, the, the, the performance that you get from stream when run inside these two VMs. So it's uh, okay that uh, it's slower, it's, it's, it's uh, less than bare metal, because now you have partition and the, uh, the CPU in two, basically, and you have uh, assigned uh, uh, each part to a different two to one VM. And uh, the important part, the nice part, uh, is that, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, the performance of the two VM is quite consistent, because they are uh, basically performing the same in all the Three, three, the four stream <coughs> operations. And then this last bar is the, basically the sum of these two, uh, which again is uh, pretty much matches uh, bare metal. And so we are happy again. Now, um, I mentioned secure encrypted virtualization. What's the, uh, I said that uh, the memory of the VM is encrypted. What's the overhead that comes with that? Uh, as a matter of fact, at least for this benchmark, is very, very slow. Uh, on papers, you find that uh, it's, it always stays within 3%. In these cases, in, uh, at least as far as I can measure, the, it stayed within 1%. And uh, yeah, another benchmark, this, this is called uh, NAS PBE. It's a very CPU intensive benchmark this time, which is what I said, memory and CPU. Uh, also uses a parallelization framework. It's OpenMPI this time, not OpenMP. And uh, this time, uh, um, lower is better. Before, I probably forgot to say higher was better. And uh, yeah, the same, the same stuff. Uh, basically, first bar bare metal, last bar VM with tuning. And we want them to match and to be very similar. And that's actually the case. Uh, with tuning applied in uh, all the various variants of the uh, NASPB benchmark. And again, I uh, also uh, benchmarked uh, um, with um, encrypted virtualization enabled or not, or, or disabled uh, with this CPU intensive benchmark. And again, less than 1% performance impact, which is very good. Now, the CPU model, in theory, uh, the, uh, this is, this is QMU that builds a virtual CPU for the virtual machine, what flags, uh, how it presents it, uh, what kind of virtual CPU uh, does QMU present to your virtual machine. Uh, in theory, if you want to achieve best possible performance, uh, you find in various pieces of documentation that you should use this thing, so host pass through. But it depends on, for example, the version of your software. In, in this case, QMU or LibVirt. As we said, this effort was about uh, uh, doing this tuning on uh, uh, these particular distributions. Distribution, sorry. And uh, as a matter of fact, the distribution went out before uh, the Epic uh, platform uh, series of processor, of processor was available. And so uh, if you use those pass-through, uh, it turns out that in this particular case, it doesn't do a good job. 
uh, and the detail uh, is here, uh, and the detail of, of why it's here, because the threads basically are not exposed correctly. So this is, uh, as a matter of fact, there is a CPU model called EPIC, which uh, is there because it's the uh, previous, it's, it's the one that represents the previous generation of EPIC processors. And if you use, if you use that one, uh, yeah, except I, yeah, except I, I, I pasted the, the, the basic same thing, but uh, that's, a, that's a typo, let's call it like that. This would have been two, and uh, it, uses a, it, it provides the VM a better, sorry for that, a better um, virtual topology. And, uh, and, and in fact, this is uh, what happens if you use OS pass-through, it's this one. So it's, again, lower is better, so it's tuning applied, but using OS pass-through as a CPU model, very, very bad, because we want it to be here. Uh, using EPIC, it's here. O of course, if you, if you go, uh, if you mm, use a more updated distribution, a new version of uh, OpenSUSE or SLI or uh, whatever other distribution uh, or just code from upstream, you will find uh, the EPIC2 uh, CPU model there and you can use it. But this was, uh, this last, the, the, I, I put this part in here because I wanted to um, stress the fact that, yes, there are all these tuning advices, but you, really should always double check because those pass through was the natural choice and uh, it wasn't performing well. Uh, now I have other stream benchmarks, but I rather try to leave some time for questions than, uh, yeah, let's see. So yeah, uh, basically the, the, the conclusions are that uh, Achieving very good performance, even performance that uh, actually matches the one of the hosts inside either one or more VMs is possible, at least for, uh, uh, certain, at least for certain workloads, and it happens mostly via, uh, via resource partitioning. If you use KVM, QMU, LibVirt in that particular product, even better if you use them from upstream, you have all the tools, all the capabilities to achieve this uh, very good resource partitioning. We at SUSE also support Xen, and you can do pretty much the same with Xen, although you will lack, uh, the performance won't be uh, as good uh, as this because uh, Xen still lacks the capability of exposing properly the virtual topology of the, uh, to the guest, a virtual topology to the guest. And uh, MD Epic 2 platform turns, turned out to be uh, quite a uh, good platform from this point of view um, because they offer great scalability, uh, offer, great, offer memory encryption with an exceptionally low overhead, uh, as we see, and because they are only affected by a subset of the, of the um, vulnerability um, flows uh, related to speculative execution. So with that, uh, yeah, Ian, in the slides, you will find a little bit more information about myself, and uh, while taking questions, let me, as we did this morning, uh, say one more time farewell to my very good friend last course with this picture taken at FOSDEM a few years ago. And yeah, but really, questions? Yeah. I see three hands, uh, I guess. Um, so were any of those benchmarks, uh, did any of those benchmarks regard VMs that span across Luma nodes? Sure. Um, uh, yeah. Sorry? Ah, perfect. Yeah, I will always forget about that. <laughs> the, question, the question is uh, whether the benchmarks, um, any of the benchmarks that I show were uh, run in a scenario where a VM was spanning multiple NUMA nodes. So when I showed these results, the one, these ones for, no, these ones, one VM, okay? If you use one VM, one very big VM, then, uh, yeah, I have another um, one slide that I didn't show, but uh, uh, let's use it uh, for that. This was uh, the VM that was using that benchmark. So it was spanning both of the NUMA nodes. It basically had all the, uh, the as, uh, pretty much as many vCPUs as there are pCPUs, with the exception of the ones that I decided to leave to the host. But this was spanning both the NUMA nodes, and so it had a uh, virtual topology exposed to, to it. And what, what, what was the gig space size that you used for the benchmarks? The question now is about what was the huge page size chosen. It was one gigabyte. Uh, the other questions, let's go there. 
So this is uh, the question was about uh, uh, since I said that uh, uh, if possible it's better to configure a VM so that it stays inside a CCD inside a CCX uh, if it goes outside stuff like that whether I have numbers for that uh, not yet again this was uh, in these slides that I uh, decided to uh, skip but uh, if you see we are con this is an ongoing effort we are running uh, uh, more benchmark, continuing doing our evaluation, and so I have, uh, I'm finished, but uh, uh, going over investigation um, with multiple VMs uh, in cases where I actually um, fulfill my own recommendation, and so I don't split CCDs and stuff, but also in cases where I uh, violate them and I put VMs across CCDs. Just as a hint, uh, um, when you start, uh, so this for example is a case uh, where six VMs were used uh, and you see that uh, the, the absolute level of the performance is the correct one, if you do the math, is the, it, this is fine, but uh, uh, the performance is, is also actually quite consistent in this case, this case, this case, but you see some strange behavior here. And that's what uh, typically, again, this is an ongoing investigation, so this is just a little bit of speculation. But what we are seeing is that uh, when you start uh, not respecting this recommendation and, and putting VMs in, uh, uh, pinning VMs in such a way that they share uh, too much resources, then what happens is that you have this... Uh, uh, not so uh, much consistent behavior uh, in the results. Mm, I have other, yeah, see, here, here, is a, here, is, here, here it is another example where the recommendations were not really uh, respected and uh, you have the performances which are not equally, uh, exactly the same in all VMs. Yeah, there was other questions, but I think we are out of time. We are, so I, I'm happy to, to answer, I mean. Just the last uh, presentation, so. No, uh, I mean, <laughs> I can. It's not recorded, but uh, if you want, then. Uh, I, I mean, I'm fine, but yeah. go ahead. I'm good with that. Sure. First of all, thank you for your talk. I very much enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, have the, these optimizations and tuning things been implemented in, for example, OpenStack already? Like, is there a plan to do that? Uh, the, I have the quest, uh, well, I guess I repeat it as well. The question was about whether this implementation, this uh, optimization are implemented in OpenStack or similar software. I have no idea. I have never played with OpenStack and I don't plan to in the foreseeable future, to be honest. Uh, I am aware of very few, um, very few efforts and very few uh, capabilities similar to the one that you are saying. So doing uh, uh, resource partitioning and optimization at this level automatically, either in OpenStack or in many other software. There are solutions, but uh, achieving this level of details in the tuning, it's quite hard because after all that, because of reasons, I mean, I don't know myself, but you have then it's a matter of interface that you uh, present to the user uh, for uh, letting him, him uh, or her able to uh, achieve this. Uh, after all, it turns out to be uh, rather similar to the XML itself because it's a very detailed uh, level of... Uh, so I'm not saying it's not possible. I would uh, really hope that uh, uh, the situation was better, but I'm not aware of any, anything that reaches this level of details. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, guys, b before that, uh, if you are leaving, please uh, pick up uh, any trash you've left, okay, uh, bottles and stuff. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> My question would be about the scenario if you explain this uh, on the right side where you have uneven um, yes. behavior. Yeah. Is it try this once with an uh, unoptimized neighbor behavior? Sorry, you said the last part? I was trying this uh, once with an unbalanced neighbor behavior and I saw that it's not 
it just influences the CPU, it also influences the bridge, uh, the bridge below. So that, for example, you have the operating system on bridge which try to swap uh, instantly instead of Yes, there are. Um, I, I haven't monitored that uh, that part, but uh, the, the fact is that, uh, at least according to me and to my experience in running similar evaluations in uh, uh, even in other platforms, uh, the consistencies of results like these uh, is something which is quite good and that you don't find very often. But as apparently, as soon as you uh, like mix things in a in the not necessarily super ideal way, then uh, these uh, very nice properties start to uh, like fade away. Uh, so, yeah, I haven't checked that, um, that that whether what you said also uh, was happening in these cases. But uh, yeah, um, I have I have a scenario with. Uh, 30 VMs where I am violating the recommendations uh, by using too many, uh, basically, threads for stream, if you count all of them uh, uh, running inside all the VMs. And uh, if you look at the actual throughput that you achieve, that's actually quite good, but it's all unbalanced. If you sum, uh, if you sum all of them up, it's, uh, it matches or, or, or uh, even overcome the one that you achieved on the host. But then it's all <laughs> uh, like that, up and downs.